So uh, we both work in the CTO office in the AI ops group. Um, so one of the projects is Log Anomaly Detector, which uh, I lead that project. Michael Clifford works on it on the core ML part. Um, and yeah, we're just going to, we want to share some lessons learned of running machine learning in production for uh, one of our internal customers. Okay, so, so we're going to spend the next, you know, 30 minutes or so talking about some of the challenges of building a machine learning system, running it in production. Um, yeah, I think this project started with uh, Michael Clifford's Jupyter Notebook and it became a whole application with a lot of other features uh, that were requested by the internal customer that we ended up building. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll go over the architecture, we'll go over some core ML concepts on natural language processing which is, which exists in a lot of things like you know um, voice assistants and a lot of other systems use uh, NLP. So don't all raise your hands, please. Who knows what logs? What are logs? Um, what are logs? <laughs> Does anybody know what logs are? Okay. It, Okay, even if you know, I'll, I'll still tell you. <laughs> so logs have a, a timestamp. Um, they have a type. Uh, they can be debug. They can be info. And there's other flags of in terms of severity. severity. Um, the interesting part is the messages. So um, a lot of systems, operating systems, um, like whenever you have a product and you want to get feedback, you might log some information on how your customers are using your product. Um, so logging is pretty uh, widely used in all over computers, right? Um, if you have a log, for example, um, and you have two applications that are um, deterministic, then you could probably recover your application back to the state that it was based on replaying the same events that happen in a log and getting it back to the same state as before. So logs have a lot of usage. Um, I guess it's not new. So um, logs might be boring for some people as well. Um, and when you're debugging systems, sometimes you have to read a lot of logs. So logs exist in databases, transaction logs to kind of track like for example, when databases fail, um, logs will, will people would have to dig through logs, check uh, error messages, and then <coughs> mediate the issue. Web analytics, like how many users you're getting from with different geographies, you can kind of uh, get metadata from your logs and kind of build dashboards and um, product analytics, getting feedback about how well, well your product is doing with the, your customers and. Uh, when it crashes, you might send some logs back to further analyze. Um, uh, for our pur our purposes, we were we wanted to use logs to do root cause analysis um, to help in root cause analysis and uh, and yeah, we'd like to share some of the lessons learned when we decided to use machine learning to solve some of this. So. Um, as I mentioned, you know, logs logs are very boring to read. Uh, there's too much, uh, too many lines of log lines. Who here loves reading log lines? One person. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Uh, if I can automate it with machine learning, that would, and it saves me some time, I would like to work on more interesting things. So, um, one thing that we wanted to think about is can we use um, so we can we use machine learning to identify patterns in our logs like anomalies for example like for example our applications working suddenly an event happens where uh, the system fails and this would be in our case considered an anomaly it rarely happens but when it does happen I want to know about it, and maybe I want to do something about it. Um, and like 
all machine learning systems, sometimes they may have false positives or false predictions. And we had to kind of innovate there on how to solve that problem as well. We'll share what we had to do in-house to solve that problem. So um, just just a high level, you know, when, when you're building, like, all the things that, 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 that use data are considered, like, data products, right? Like, Facebook news feed is a data product. Um, uh, a lot of things that use data are data products. Um, when they may have a machine learning model, they may have one, or they may have many machine learning models. Um, when you do deploy a machine learning system in production, you want to make sure you track metrics on how well is it performing, how many predictions is it uh, producing, and how many false positives are you getting. And if you can get a subject matter expert to give feedback, that further enhances the system. And you may want to do some A-B testing, maybe test different experiments as well. And uh, yeah, um, Michael, maybe if you can share some, some motivations on. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm just going to talk a little bit, kind of like a higher order goal uh, that I think about when thinking about log anomaly detection, real time log anomaly detection, and kind of why would somebody actually want to do something like this? Um, obviously, Zach talked about reading fewer logs. Um, kind of the higher order goal that you might be thinking about is kind of there's a cost of both time and money general resources to applications being down. So really what happens is, you know, when something goes wrong with your application, there are two big costs, and it's developer time, both um, just figuring out what went wrong and then fixing what went wrong. And while that application is down, you're, if you're, let's say, you're an e-commerce site of some kind, those transactions are, like, not occurring, so you're losing money in that sense. Or just pure, like, if you just have some service, you're having user confidence erosion that's occurring. So down applications is, like, a very bad thing. Um, and so what you want to do, so both of these issues are directly correlated with this notion of, like, time. So the way that I would like to think about this problem is how can we actually like, reduce the amount of time that an application is down for? Um, and I think that with automated log anomaly detection, like that is the tool by which we decrease the amount of time that application is down. And specifically, um, <clears throat> with the particular implementation that we're working on now, is focusing in on that like sleuthing time that a, that a developer has to spend figuring out what exactly went wrong. Um, so ideally here you have, have a whole stream of logs, and instead of looking at all of them and figuring out which one went wrong, developing a system that can highlight and alert and kind of order the logs that came through by like level of severity or anomalousness. Um, so that's kind of the near-term goal and directly what this project is focusing on. But obviously like, the far-term goal would be to actually have something that has some kind of automated fault recovery built in that's outside the scope of this particular project. But ideally, if this goes well, that would be like the foundation for that type of a system um, in the future. And then, yeah, Zach will tell us a, bit, a little bit more about the design challenges that we have to overcome to, to solve these problems. So, so, so um, I mean, w when you're collecting a lot of data, right, um, a, a message, right, like the message, the log message that you get, how do you create meaning from it? And, and then how do you, how do, you do um, unsupervised machine learning on it when you don't have labels for the data that, that's coming in? Um, and then the other part was um, having subject matter experts giving feedback to reinforce was my model actually predicting the correct results that you're expecting. Um, and then system scalability challenges, for example, with Elasticsearch, if you try to make a single call with the, their API, um, to, I think there's like if you go past 10,000 log messages, then uh, the client may... Uh, see some scalability issues. Um, uh, and then the volume of data as well. Um, and, you know, designing a system like this, like, sometimes there's there's no blueprint of, like, exactly how do you solve, like, the feedback loop uh, problem. But um, that's what open source is all about, innovating and inventing if, if it doesn't exist. 
So this is the, the, the high-level uh, architecture of the system. Um, the orange box that you see over there with the model training and inference, that's the component that Michael Clifford um, co uh, created and, and works on. Um, and that's the core uh, brains of the system. Um, and basically, that training bit, um, Michael Clifford is going to go more in depth and, and give us more of a, more of a high level uh, on natural language processing and how the, the, those bits tie together. Um, the other component is called uh, the fact store, which is a an application which um, tracks the events, the log events, and also tracks the feedback that uh, the user would provide. For example, when a user does get a get a prediction, there's they, they get an email sent, and then with a with a link uh, in that email, and they'll they would get directed to the fax store to give feedback. Was this an anomaly? Yes or no? And they can provide some notes on more detail on why they say yes or no. Um, uh, I mentioned in a previous slide about making sure you monitor the performance and the quality of your machine learning system, uh, how well it's performing. Um, that both gives the data science scientists more insight on how well their code, code is actually running and also um, get, gets us to kind of like push to better better uh, results and, and try to see if we maybe may make some experiments and we can kind of weigh in and see how well is our experiment working out. And finally, um, uh, the way that we do send notifications with uh, prediction results is we use this system called uh, ElastAlert. And what ElastAlert does is it just listens in to um, an Elasticsearch index and whenever um, data that follows a particular query, then it would send an email uh, notification to the, the user. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Mike, Michael, to, to, to give us more in-depth detail on the wor crazy world of NLP. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about kind of, kind of the problem statement a little bit around log anomaly detection and how you do this. Um, but first, I just want to step back and kind of help everyone get an intuition for kind of what is log anomaly detection. Uh, so here we have a data set here. Uh, can anyone here tell me where the anomaly is, by any chance? Uh, yes, that's right. So there's an anomaly here up in the upper left-hand corner. And, you know, if you have some statistical background, you might be able to tell this is like some kind of two-dimensional Gaussian cloud of points, um, and that clearly that point was not generated from the same underlying probability distribution. Um, but without knowing that, like humans in 2D are very good at solving this kind of a problem. Um, but what if we had a different type of data set that wasn't like spatially distributed, or didn't, wasn't re represented like geometric, geometrically? Like this, for example. Um, let's say you require subject matter expertise. And if any of you guys here are understanding the talk that we're giving right now, I'm going to assume that you're all subject matter experts in English. And so if I gave any of you guys here this small data set of, of character strings, red, yellow, green, blue, and chair, I'm hoping you guys can tell me which of these is the anomaly here. Any volunteers? Any volunteer? <laughs> Anybody? Really? Which one is an anomaly? <laughs> yeah? So. Yes. That's so correct. So obviously chair is the anomaly here. <laughs> <laughs> but so how like but so I'm glad so you guys are getting intuition for this type of problem. And the question is like how do you how do you formalize this in a way that a computer can do this for you? Because what if you're trying to solve the same problem in like eight dimensions geometrically or you have a million words that you're looking for? Like how exactly would, would you do this? And it becomes a task that all of a sudden becomes like well suited for automation if you can determine a way to get this kind of a data representation into a, a machine learning tool. Um, so the way that I think about the LAD core is really um, existing in three parts. 
Uh, there's like your source of logs, and it's a semi-structured stream of logs. I say they're semi-structured because as Zach noted earlier, logs do have some inherent structure to them. There's a timestamp, there's a, a flag, and there's a message. But a lot of like the rich information is really in that message, and the message is is unsuper as a unstructured data type, essentially just list of character strings, um, a variable length list of character strings, which barring some like pretty cutting edge deep learning techniques is just like not well suited to most machine learning algorithms. So we need a method to go from the semi-structured stream of logs to some kind of text encoding where we actually have a like fixed length vector representation of our logs that ideally like retains some kind of semantic meaning or me meaning of any kind uh, that we can use to, to represent these logs. And then finally, logs are application specific. Um, there's tons and tons of them. They're really expensive to get like a labeled data set of these types of things. You basically have to have like the application developer sit there and manually label each of these logs, which is just really not feasible. So you have to think about this as like an unsupervised learning problem. Um, so the three particular like tools that we're implementing in this particular like instance, uh, Elasticsearch is just our source of logs. I know there's some kind of a few different ways to, to get the logs in, but that's what we're using currently. And then we're using word to vec as our um, kind of encoding method. And then finally we're using a self-organizing map as our inference engine to actually make decisions about these anomalies. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about word to vec and SOM just again so you guys can understand what, what's going on here. So this is a super, super simplified example of word to vec but essentially you have some data set, some corpus of natural language. Um, here is the, the cat sat on the mat. And then it defines each of the individual elements that are in this data set and sets up your like vocabulary. So you have one row for each unique word. And then through kind of a deep learning and coding process, you're able to determine these dense uh, numerical, fixed length numerical vectors that retain the, um, ideally retains like the semantic meaning of the, the natural language that you put in. If you go to the next slide. And the way that it does this is through this process of essentially taking the two, the, over many, many iterations and much, and tons of data, it looks at like the words that surround a particular word and attempts to predict that middle word. And after doing this a million times, billion times with a, like a neural network of some kind, you're actually able to like extract one of the hidden layers and use that as like an encoding um, tool to convert these variable length characters into fixed length vectors and that maintain their semantic meaning ideally. If you go to the next slide, I'll give you kind of the classic example of what does it mean to retain its semantic meaning. Um, so this is an example, I don't know if you guys are familiar with word to vec at all, but this is a very canonical example that if you take the word vector for king, subtract the word vector for man, add the word vector for woman, you end up in your like n-dimensional word vector space somewhere very close to the vector for queen. So in this sense we can actually do some kind of, uh, we can visualize the data and we can do some arithmetic on it that is actually like meaningful to subject matter experts in English. So the goal here is kind of to do the same thing with our logs. So instead of having words, we have logs that exist in this n-dimensional log space that we've created through kind of using word to vec And hopefully we can get the same kind of thing where we're able to identify these like clear outliers from the rest of the data set. Um, but yeah, so now we have a bunch of logs. We've gone from variable length character strings to like a space in which we can represent our logs and do arithmetic on them, visualize them, uh, but more importantly, you can actually like put them into some machine learning algorithms to make decisions about them. And so the machine learning, the unsupervised machine learning algorithm that we've decided to use for this particular project is something called a self-organizing map or a Cronin map. Uh, when you're looking at here, so instead of using the logs, this is just a this is uh, the color space that's being used as an analogy to represent what, like, how high dimensional data is processed through this, this tool. But basically you go from some unorganized random map 
and through many iterations, it kind of learns the ordered underlying like distribution of the uh, the data that it's being trained on. So here, it's essentially learning like the color spectrum, um, which is what we so we want to do the same kind of process with logs. So ideally, after taking these vectorized logs and running them through the self-organizing map, we're left with a map that kind of maps to the underlying distribution of what our like normal log space should look like. And then once we've done that, we have a trained map that, like I said, like kind of represents what, what normal is in our, in our log stream. And then we can take in a new log that we haven't, maybe we've seen it before, maybe we haven't, but it's new. And let's say we do something kind of silly and we use a three dimensional or a three vector length uh, word vec encoding so we can represent it as this very specific shade of red here. And then we can compare it to every other node on the map and kind of find its best matching unit. And from there we can actually just measure the distance in this log space that we've created for ourselves and determine kind of how far away is it from its nearest neighbor essentially like on the map. And from that, we can generate a, an anomaly score that we can then use to um, set a threshold. And so, you know, anything over 0.95, we're going to consider an anomaly or however we want to do it. So then from there, um, we can kind of alert the user or whatever we want to do. But we're basically, next slide, we now have gone from a stream of kind of unstructured character strings to a fixed length vector embedding that hopefully retains some of the semantic meaning to an inference engine that we can use to actually tell us something about our anomalies as they're moving through. Do you only check the distance from the nearest neighbor or to the centroid itself? Um, so because we're checking, so there is no centroid. It's not, sorry. I'll explain my question because okay. if you have two outliers, uh, so the second one, uh, uh, they both have uh, nearest neighbors that might be very close, but they are really out of the main uh, centroid. Yeah, so the self-organizing map kind of self-corrects for that kind of a problem because you only have, you have so many logs and you only have so many nodes on the map that the nodes aren't actually like replicas of your data set. They're like approximations to things that had seen before. So it's only things that are actually captured on the map um, that would be relevant. And they should be generally not represent outliers. And yeah, and Zach's going to go ahead and talk to you guys about running this in production. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned before, um, you know, um, it's, it, we do have a system currently that's this training and running all this stuff. Um, and just I'm just going to go into more of the details on the production, uh, what we've learned in, in production. So um, one thing that's very important is to have subject matter experts that can, you know, um, validate your these uh, the this model and, and verify, it, like, was this uh, anomaly really an anomaly? Um, and one thing that we've learned is that the system does not report any um, when there's no anomalies the system won't report any anomalies at all um, when there is anomalies it may report an anomaly but then um, there's there we, we have a as I mentioned before we do have emails that get sent with a link uh, in the email that the that the, the subject matter expert can respond to and, and give us feedback on it Kind of, uh, we want to we want to have a system that self corrects and learns from um, past mistakes, like getting the false prediction. Um, so uh, we, Michael Clifford here, had a hypothesis about you know if we increase the frequency of, of uh, noise in the data set, then we can decrease the score for the log that was reported as an anomaly, and um, that that did uh, cause cause the score to decrease and go under the, the threshold, and then the next training run, the 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 model won't report this log as an anomaly anymore because the we had our our, our feedback system that was in place that that gave the feedback um, 
as you can see the score was up here and then it went down here because we increased it to 10,000 uh, uh, log lines for that particular one um, and one one thing that's very important is when when you do have hypothesis of how like how these systems work you want to have a CI system in place and unit tests in place that will build when you build your code will validate these these uh, these things um, so the fact store a little bit more detail on the fact store is so it's a flask web application it uses SQL alchemy and as the back end to connect to a database we're currently using MySQL but I mean you could probably plug in uh, Postgres or any of the other database providers with just a connection string so very easy to um, switch databases um, uh, it's it's really really good way to to just validate uh, any concerns um, and then the the other thing that, that that also was important for us to to build in place was a dashboard uh, metrics uh, something uh, graphical so this is uh, an older dashboard but I'm going to show you a live demo of the new dashboard that uh, is still in development but um uh, yeah let's um, I guess we, this is the email that would get sent to uh, a user to say that this log line was an anomaly and this would be like a link here we use an ID here uh, we automatically generate for every prediction we generate an ID and then that prediction gets um, stored in our in our, in our fax store and then we have a foreign key in the other table which is the feedback that connects the event to the actual prediction to the feedback that was given by the by the subject matter expert the fact store is super simple web application it's a form that you would submit and yeah it just saves uh, the metadata to the, the database um, let's do a demo because you know all this talking and presentation it's it's better to actually see something real wouldn't you agree okay so we will show you the demo okay this is the dashboard so we have um, logs coming in um, these are normal logs this is anomaly this is the current um, ingest of, of data so right now it just ingested four logs. Uh, this is the total anomalies that were found. Um, this is the average score. Uh, this is the threshold. Um, this is the number of false positives. So for example, when the system finds that, um, okay, this message was reported as a false positive by our subject matter experts, one it's gonna we're gonna track this as a metric that we found this happening again and then two we're gonna um, we're gonna disable the user the subject matter expert from getting another email because when once you give feedback you should never get that false prediction again so in we're we're, we're making sure the the model in two places there's two checks the first check is the training and making sure that the model actually um, doesn't provide any more false positive predictions and then the second part is if we do see that same message again we track that we see we see the same message coming in that was part of that uh, list of uh, messages that we've seen before that were false positives um, so this is a pretty simple uh, dashboard uh, just uh, shows some some information on on that um, and yeah this project is in development um, so let's 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 simulate you know maybe a lot of anomalies happening for example um, so let me just for no smokes and mirrors it's good to have like no safety net and just do stuff and uh, hope that your demo doesn't fail 
And I have a lot of things on my screen. Please don't judge. <laughs> and I lost my terminal. And I found my terminal. Here it is. Yeah. Is the font big enough? Okay. All right. Let's see it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so this is the regular um, um, YAML file. So the, the code is basically Python, uh, of course, because I wrote Python, app.py. Um, and uh, there's a configuration file that comes with it. Um, let's just look at that configuration file. Ooh. Okay, so the configuration file takes certain parameters like, okay, what, what is the name of the model file and um, the time span, the slice window of data that you want to pull down at a particular time. Um, the max entries, uh, as I mentioned before, Elasticsearch does have that limitation of like, if you pull too much data, your app may crash. So we, we only pull down a certain amount of data. Um, and then... Uh, how many times we do it in inference. Uh, so we do the first training run, we pull the data down, we train it, and then we produce a model, and then we do the inference part where we pull new logs down, and we do the inference, and then there's inference loop that happens, and this is all configurable, so if you want to configure it, you can. And then the threshold, the, um, the stuff I was showing you guys earlier, with uh, the bar of how high it should be, the threshold of what is an anomaly, what score should should be. Um, this threshold is a calculation. Um, maybe Michael Clifford can tell us more about that ca threshold calculation. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so one of the reasons that we look at the, so I said the threshold, we gather some information about the distance of things from the map. Um, and just like a good, if we can assume that our kind of data is Gaussianly distributed and a good idea of like what is an outlier is three times um, three standard deviations away from the mean. So basically this is just a number that you can tune depending on how many standard deviations away from the mean uh, you want to consider as anomalies. So um, uh, and, and furthermore like the, these are the endpoints to connect to Elasticsearch. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's the that's the configuration file. There's more configurations, but you can check out our GitHub, uh, and we document all these different parameters that you can set. Okay, so let's let's mess with our demo a bit. Um, let's let's give it some. Let's simulate uh, more anomalies. So if we do, is that? Uh, if we set this to like. Zero point one, then it's gonna be really the bar is gonna be really low. So whatever comes through is is just gonna be um, it might be uh, tagged as an anomaly. But this is just for demonstration purposes. Um, of course, we're not gonna be doing this on a production system. We're gonna be doing this to demonstrate so you guys get the idea. But uh, like I said, no safety net. That's how we roll. All right, it's training. I don't know what that is for. It's pulling some data down. Hopefully, it's it's gonna work. Yeah, it's training. You see the epochs. You see the time that the training took. Um, found some anomalies, it has some scores there. Uh, we do track a lot of this stuff in Prometheus, so we can, we can go into Prometheus and then it'll stop and it'll wait till the next sliding window of when it's going to pull more data down and then do the prediction again. Uh, so, um, I think we covered a lot of ground here. 
um, before we uh, go for s to summarize this, um, does anybody have any questions? Everybody's putting up their hand. Okay, one, two, three. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that in case of false positive, when uh, something comes up as an anomaly and it's not an anomaly, how do you make sure that the model corrects for it? Because you, are you creating more anomalies which are sim more entries which are similar to the false positive, or how are you correcting? For it? Because it's just clustering, as far as I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly right. I mean, basically, on the next retraining iteration, we be, we're ensure to include like many copies of this like false positive so that the model learns to like basically associate that with normal behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually mine was a good follow-up for that one because so yeah, you like basically retrain it with a huge duplication factor on certain numbers of uh, logs. I mean, a psalm has got kind of like a finite memory, right? I mean, if it's yeah. 30 by 30, it can store kind of like 900 archetypes. Yeah. Um, so have you ever noticed it starting to forget some other normal things when you like reweight that and force it to learn a, you know, a I mean, new thing? Yeah, I think there's a trade off there. Um, that's definitely an issue if it just, you know, if you're packing it with a bunch of copies of the same thing, it'll start to kind of become a homogenous map. Um, so that's definitely a, an issue, but you know, when you're trying to solve for it. the false positive case, this is one solution that we came up with essentially, but definitely having this number not just be infinite in some hyperparameter to be tuned is something to, to consider. Yeah. Back there, oh, yeah, go ahead. How do you handle false negatives? Uh, I don't still think working on it. <laughs> yeah, we're still. It, this is this is in development, so we're literally still making commits to it. So, I mean, that is a good question. Though. I mean, how do you find the things that haven't been found? Like, how do you quantify that number? Mm -hmm. It's a tough problem for unsupervised learning. But but uh, one thing that we do know that it, it hasn't reported when there's no anomalies, it hasn't reported that there there is an anomaly. When there is an anomaly, then that's when it's in question. We want to try to improve on that. So before it was running production, before we were able to have a feedback mechanism to have the label for the data. So how do you decide it's a working anomaly detection model? So how do you convince like, the group to make it into production? Uh, inspection. <laughs> uh, working alongside the subject matter experts is basically of what we found to be the best way to do it, because they're going to be ultimately the end users. Mm -hmm. um, and if you kind of provide them with a sample, you basically work with them and get a sample data set, mm -hmm. run it through, ask them, you know, does this seem reasonable to you? Um, and based on that is how we're, we're currently doing it. Um, ideally, we'd like to have kind of like a golden data set that's labeled that we could use to kind of pressure test all these things. Um, but that's still uh, in progress. Yep. Yep. It's a question over here. Oh. <laughs> Power cord mishaps. <laughs> so uh, I, I assume that the, the application log, whatever it is, it will have a finite number of words, even if there are 10 million lines. Yep. So it may be the training part, once it is trained, it should be able to predict. But whereas in case of natural language, so let's consider two states. The cat is in the mat. It is, it is a happy state. Mm -hmm. And then there's another, another word, the set of words that says, let the cat come out of the bag. Mm -hmm. so that may be an explosive situation. Yep. So how does it differentiate this kind of situation? Yeah, so I mean, the kind of the underlying assumption is that the data set under which we train it represents like a series of not of normal behavior, right? So we're, we're trying to model what normal behavior, well, this normal series of logs looks like for some period of time. And if you're starting to get a like 
high rate of logs that we consider anomalous or it hasn't seen before, um, or yeah, that's very far from the map, then you're going to want to say that there's there's an issue. Um, but if so, if you just had those two cases and you trained on those two cases, you won't, I don't think you'd be able to like make a proper differentiation. My question is, if it is an application, so the logs will be the same. The failure cases are success cases. The numbers, uh, the instances may change. Uh, for example, if it is a banking application, the cases will be the same. The logs will be the same. Whereas if it is a, if you're, if you're looking at the logs for a social media application like Facebook, mm -hmm. we don't know what the outcome is. Everything is different. Mm -hmm. so that, that may be larger for you to train, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I understand your correction, your question correctly. It's just this idea that like logs are not natural language in like the wider sense. There's some kind of like machine. They're not machine code, but there's only a fixed set of logs that can possibly come out yeah. of a system. So you have a smaller vocabulary to deal with. So I think about that more as like an, a way to kind of like optimize the word to vec encoding part of it, so you can kind of you'll see all the words that you're ever going to see rather quickly, but then kind of what normal behavior is over time can change for a particular application. So you want to always be kind of continually retraining this thing to manage the data drift, I guess as they call it, um, and just make sure that basically you train it to understand what normal operating procedure looks like, and then if that deviates from that too significantly, somebody gets an email. Thank you. So just, uh, is there any more questions before we close up? Actually, I, my question is kind of fundamental. Normally, when you construct a lock, uh, it's, it's already labeled, whether it's an error lock or normal info lock. So uh, the purpose I was guessing is uh, you log is try to get some abnormal operating situations from the normal lock. It's not error lock, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if like yeah, quick solution to this problem would just be you know find all error messages. Um, but yeah, we're trying to do something um, that kind of goes beyond that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically looking for anomalies, like things that are not normally, that normally don't happen. Uh -huh. um, then just making sure that DevOps folks can, can uh, this, this okay. customer can get, get notified first before, before it, it, it you know, becomes get a serious it. issue. Okay, another question is uh, about the, the word VEX. Uh, is that the... just for uh, English? Uh, do you ever try to another language for this? Uh, no. I have not tried it for a different language. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> not, not yet, but we definitely love contributions, and this this is open source. So definitely, um, if, if if that's something that you're interested in, and we, we're definitely open for contributions. Um, and yeah, just wanted to to recap on on what we we covered today. Um, we went through um, NLP, just went through some uh, examples and try to get the understanding of the LAD core, LAD core. Um, we went through the architecture. We looked at um, running something in production and just some of the, the considerations to, to look at when running something like a machine learning system in production. And, um, and yeah, we learned about this project. And it is open source, like I said. Um, We'd love contributions. Um, even if, if you have feedback for us to like kind of any questions or, or something that you want as a feature, you know, we, we're definitely open to new ideas. You know, best ideas win. Doesn't matter how much experience you have. It's it's all about best ideas. So we welcome them. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for staying so late.